recent university study at a major college took six months, five graduate students, and $10,000, and they came up with an amazing conclusion. Women and men think differently. Could have spent one night in my house for free and came to that same conclusion. You know, I spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week in the company of women. Every woman, I, every patient I see in the office is a woman. I come home to a wonderful wife who's a female. Both my kids are women, and even my dog and my goldfish are female. So I know that men and women think differently. On the way preparing to come up here, I was in my closet with my wife, and I was looking around, and after about 10 minutes, she comes out and says, I don't have a thing to wear. Well, as a woman, she's saying, I don't have anything new to wear. I come out of that same closet after about 15 minutes and say, I don't have a thing to wear. Well, what I mean is I don't have anything clean <laughs> to wear. Men and women think differently. Think about this. When was the last time you went to a restaurant with two or three of your favorite couples and you sit down and your, your husband stands up and says, Bill, Frank, Bob, I've got to go to the bathroom. Would you like to come? just doesn't happen. In fact, I'd be a little worried if it did. <laughs> men and women think differently. When a woman hears menopause, she hears two words oftentimes, mental and pause. Now, when a man hears it, he hears two words often, also, wrinkles and depends. <laughs> so men and women think differently. And you know, the reason that men and women think differently is largely due to hormones. Hormones influence almost every aspect of our lives. So we want to focus now on some very specific hormonal changes that occur largely in a 35 to 45 year old age group. And we're going to focus predominantly on PMS and perimenopause. Now, first of all, PMS is real. It's not imagined, it's not in your head, it's a very real scientific syndrome. Probably no other hormonal problem has been more patronized or maligned than PMS. Women are sick of this patting you on the head and say, oh darling, it's just your hormones kind of attitude. So we're beginning to see that change and it's exciting because it, it really allows women to say, I'm not satisfied with the status quo. PMS is very real. It stands for premenstrual syndrome. Now you'll hear many different terms, premenstrual magnification disorder, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, uh, but we're going to use the, the classic PMS. And it doesn't stand for punishing men slowly. <laughs> it, it is a very real scientific entity. And I want to give you the definition. In fact, I'm going to use a lot of definitions today because it's so important that you don't mishear or misinterpret what I say. Don't be like the old fellow who went in for his exam, about a 90-year-old guy, and went in and he was really doing quite well, but he was a little hard of hearing. Well, he goes out and the next day the doctor's walking down the street and he, he looks over and he sees a fellow walking down the street with this beautiful 20-year-old blonde on his arm. And he looks at him and the guy says, thanks, doc. <laughs> The doctor looked back and said, what are you talking about? He said, well, the advice you gave me yesterday in the office. The doctor looked at him kind of confused. He said, yeah, doc, you told me to, to get a hot mama and be cheerful. <laughs> the doctor said, no. I said, you've got a heart murmur, so be careful. <laughs> so don't mishear what I'm saying here. I want you to understand the definition because the definition of PMS is so critical to its appropriate treatment. So what is the definition? PMS is simply repetitive, predictable, recurrent, bothersome symptoms that occur predominantly in the second half of the menstrual cycle. Now I want to break that down because it's very critical that you understand each part of that definition. One, it's predictable. You know, I have women in my office that can literally tell me to the second when symptoms are going to occur. These symptoms are predictable. You know when they're going to happen because they happen repetitively. And that's the second part of that diagnosis. Now, I'm not talking about some symptoms that may happen in December and September and June. I'm talking about month after month, you get the same or very similar symptoms that occur. Very critical distinction. The next thing is they have to be bothersome. About 80% of women will see 
menstrual related changes in either behavior or physical events. But for most women, they're not that bothersome. It's not that big a deal. But to truly meet the diagnosis of PMS, those symptoms have to be bothersome. And it only makes sense because no one's ever died from terminal PMS. And the only reason we do anything about it is because of the intensity of symptoms. So if the symptoms are not bothersome, if there's something that you can deal with, you know what they're due to and you know they're temporary, then we don't get real aggressive about looking at any type of treatments. And then the final part of that definition is it occurs in the second half or the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle. The menstrual cycle is divided into two phases, from the beginning of the period until ovulation, and then from ovulation to the onset of the period. And for to meet the criteria for true PMS, those symptoms need to occur in the second half of the menstrual cycle. If you're having a lot of PMS symptoms that you think may be PMS, but they're occurring throughout the cycle, you might need to look at other explanations. You might need to look at other things that may cause these symptoms. So it's very important that you understand that, that uh, actual, that, that definition because that's what really makes the diagnosis. If you really want to make your doctor or your healthcare worker happy, take them a symptom diary. Now, what is a symptom diary? It's simply a, whether you get it a little calendar or something you can write on where you list your symptoms. You take a, a day and you write down, okay, I'm having bloating on this day or I'm having uh, anger on this day. Or, and what you do is you also rate the intensity from one to 10. Is it good? Is it a mild symptom? Is it severe? Am I ready to go run over my husband in the car? You know, whatever the symptom is at that point. And you take that into your doctor when you go. What an amazing, he will probably cut your bill in half. Yeah, right. Maybe not, maybe not, you're right. But you'll, you'll make a friend because that's how you make the diagnosis. There's no blood test, there's no x-ray that can tell you if you have true PMS. It comes simply by the symptoms and when they occur in the cycle. Now, why is that important? Because there are many pretenders to PMS. There are many symptoms that can arise from many different sources. Things like too much thyroid, too little thyroid, things like hypoglycemia or low sugar can give identical symptoms. Perimenopause, We'll make that distinction later, but perimenopause can masquerade. Some medications can actually have symptoms that are truly PMS. Birth control pills have been associated with PMS symptoms. So it's absolutely important that you graph those symptoms out, take that into your physician, and use that as a tool to make the diagnosis. Well, all that's good, all that's well, but what happens when you're, you're ready to scream at your kids or you sit down and you eat a bowl of cake mix all at one setting and you say, okay, it's time to do something about these symptoms. And that's the reason we're here is to, to talk about ways of avoiding those. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the symptoms that can arise in PMS. And what we have found is that some of the symptoms are rather surprising. They're rather uh, not what you would normally expect. Everybody knows the mood changes and everybody knows the, the different things associated with the emotional changes, but look at some of these symptoms that you might not have associated with PMS. For example, bruising, insomnia, panic attacks, back and muscle aches. Now this is a very small list. In my book, Holy Hormones, I list about 50 or 60 different symptoms that have been associated with PMS. And some studies now actually indicate up to 150 different symptoms. Now this tells us two things when you look at these symptoms. It tells us one, there's a tremendous variety of both physical and emotional symptoms that can be experienced. And there's also, if you look at this, you can imagine there's not one single cause of all these particular symptoms. And therein lies part of the problem with the treatment of PMS. We have not identified exactly what 
causes it. And of course, if you don't know exactly what causes something, sometimes it's very difficult to treat it. Of course, we know that there are some well-known associations. For example, there's probably a genetic predisposition to PMS, and meaning that if your mother had a problem with it or if you have a sister, chances are you may have more of a problem with it than the general population, but that's not everything. We know that stress can play a role. We know that, that certain medications can aggravate symptoms. We know that environment influences. Obviously, there's a hormonal component because of the nature of the, the cycle and the way the symptoms cycle. So we know uh, some of the things that do that, but we don't know exactly what causes it. And that's why the treatment sometimes can be very difficult. And that's why the treatment is individualized. You can't go out of here and talk to Aunt Mary and find out what she's doing for her PMS and think that automatically that's going to work for you. God has made you a unique individual. All you have to do is look at your fingerprint. There's no one in the history of the universe that's ever had that same fingerprint or ever will have. You are a unique, special creature in God's eyes. And in that same vein, we understand that the treatment of PMS is very unique and very individualized. Well, let's talk about treatment, and I'm going to give you a quick way that you'll never forget to know how to treat PMS sex. Now, before you run out of here screaming, uh, I, I said that in one conference and one lady stood up and said, well, if that's the treatment, I'm just going to have to have it. <laughs> <laughs> but that stands for some things. It's an anagram so you can remember what it stands for. The S stands for stress management. I see a lot of people going, phew. The S stands for stress management. As I mentioned, stress is like the volume control in the symptom stereo. Many women who have some very mild PMS symptoms, not really bothersome, not really uh, trouble for them, when placed in stressful situations, see those symptoms like they're put under a magnifying glass. They're greatly enhanced. And for many women, just getting a handle on their stresses can virtually eliminate symptoms or make them such that they're not that bothersome like we talked about before. Now certainly we don't have the time to go into specific stress management techniques, but I just want you to know that there's tremendous resources that are available out there to you, both in book form and in places in your churches. For example, step number one for many people is identify the stressor. Now that sounds so simple and so easy, but that's oftentimes the most difficult thing. And that's where a good Christian counselor or a pastor or a, a caring layperson who's trained to help be a mirror can reflect back to you some of those things that may be unknown to you consciously or subconsciously that are causing the stress. Like anything else, you've got to identify it before you can do the second step, and that's release it. You've got to let it go. And that's where a lot of the stress management techniques come in. I tell you, the greatest text ever written on stress management is the second half of the sixth chapter of Matthew. Go home today and read that, and that'll teach you how to begin to deal with some of your stresses. 1 Peter 5, 6, six and 7 says, you, you have to humble yourself before a mighty God. Cast all your anxiety on Him because He loves you. The E, I bet you can guess what it stands for. Exercise. Every study that's ever been done on PMS shows a marked improvement. And you don't have to go out and train for a marathon. We're talking about something as simple as a 30-minute walk three times a week can make an amazing difference. And it's not just voodoo or hocus-pocus. There's a physiological reason that exercise helps. It produces chemicals in the bloodstream called endorphins. And those endorphins attach to the same receptors in the brain that promote senses of well-being and good feelings. So you've got to make that effort to exercise. It will make a difference in virtually every aspect, especially in PMS. Now what about the, the last, the extras? I had to cheat on the anagram and I misspelled extras, but you'll forgive me for that. And that's a whole variety, again, this cornucopia of nutraceuticals and pharmaceuticals that God has provided for you to really use as tools to make that time a celebration. 
Let's talk about a few of those. Diet. Now, I don't even like that word. I'm using it. I'm using it as a noun, not a verb. You know, why would you want to do something that starts with D-I-E? <laughs> Think about it. In a word, the most appropriate dietary change for PMS treatment is vegetarian. A vegetarian-based diet has been very effective at reducing PMS symptoms, predominantly for two reasons. One, it reduces the saturated fat in the diet. And many, many studies have shown that PMS symptoms are greatly aggravated by higher saturated fat diets. So a vegetarian diet can reduce that. It also increases the fiber in your diet. And we know that people who have higher levels of fiber in their diet not only help cardiovascular, and we all kind of know that in the heart disease, but it increases the amount of estrogen secreted from the body. It acts as a balancing act in a way. And we know that some of the symptoms in PMS are that balance between estrogen and progesterone. So increasing the fiber in your diet can really make a difference in that aspect also. We already mentioned kind of a lower fat diet, specifically saturated fats. Now some fat is good. You can take it to the extreme. You can go overboard. If we didn't have any fat in our diets, we'd be what? Dead. So fats are important, but it's the right kind of fats. And it's the saturated fats that we find in a lot of the oils and a lot of in, in red meat that sometimes can intensify PMS symptoms. Another good dietary habit with regards to PMS is minimize the sugars in your diet. All the good stuff, right? <laughs> minimize the sugars in your diet. Things like glucose and sucrose, table sugar and simple sugars. They cause a real fluctuation, almost a roller coaster effect on your blood sugar level. And we know that some individuals who have fluctuations in their blood sugar levels during the PMS time, again, see a real exacerbation of those symptoms. So trying to minimize the sugar in your diet is extremely important. Increase protein. The building blocks of protein are amino acids and amino acids are also the building blocks for the neurotransmitters or the brain hormones that many of you are familiar with. For example, serotonin. That's a brain hormone that's responsible for moods and emotions. And we know people that have higher protein diets tend to have better metabolism and better uh, creation of these, uh, these neurotransmitters which promote health and wellness. Now just as important are the things that are good to put in your system, there's some very important things you've got to eliminate from your system. One of those is caffeine. If you're a Java junkie, you've got to change that habit or you may never eliminate PMS symptoms from your system. We found that caffeine acts as a trigger in many cases. Coffee, tea, sodas, chocolate, you've got to do that. I've seen people virtually eliminate their hormonal symptoms by just eliminating caffeine. Alcohol, you want to minimize or eliminate that from your diet. Believe it or not, many women will use alcohol to medicate, self-medicate their PMS symptoms. It just makes them worse. Salt, one of the symptoms we associate with bloating and fluid retention. If you reduce the salt intake in your diet, you can see an improvement in those symptoms. What are some of the natural tools or the herbal products that are available to treat PMS? Well, there's a number of them out there. You've got to be selective. Number one, vitamin E. Vitamin E can be very effective in helping for things like breast tenderness. Chaseberry and black cohosh are two herbal remedies that have been associated with a great improvement in PMS symptoms. Natural progesterone cream and calcium also can be beneficial. So there's a lot of information out there. I challenge you to be a critical consumer. Get some more information like uh, in a book like Holy Hormones where you're going to get more specifics. Now let's talk for just a second about the perimenopause because I think that's very critical because it's the time surrounding the menopause. And I want to show you some symptoms that are associated with the perimenopause. And I think what you'll see first is there's a lot of overlap with the same symptoms of PMS. And there's one of the critical distinctions that you must make between these two because they're caused from different sources. So the way we treat them are going to be different. And we're going to spend the next segment talking about specific treatments that we can use to really alleviate these symptoms because that's what we're all here for is to learn how to handle these symptoms. 
Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. I'm already experiencing quite a few of those in the perimenopause, but what did you mean about visual changes? One of the most common problems associated with the perimenopause is that decline in estrogen, which leads to a decreased lubrication in virtually all parts of the body. And one in particular that affects vision is in the, in the eyeballs. You can actually see a decreased lubrication and a decreased secretions, which can cause a change in your visual acuity, your ability to focus. So we, we talk to our ophthalmologist friends, and a lot of times they'll see changes changes that happen during this time frame that are due to these fluctuations in the hormone levels and there are ways of correcting that. Sometimes using natural or prescription medications you can correct those changes and really reverse it. It's not something that's necessarily permanent. Is there another question? Yes ma'am. You talked about PMS and perimenopause. How do you know when you go from PMS to perimenopause? Great question, and it's a critical distinction that has to be made because they are treated very differently. There are some blood tests and a saliva test that your physician can do that can help make the distinction between PMS and menopause, perimenopause. Remember we said that PMS, you still have all your hormones being produced, but there may be a little imbalance. But with the perimenopause and menopause, you're actually seeing a decline in the absolute number of hormones. And it happens gradually. But there are some blood tests that we can help to determine the functioning of their ovaries. And because those symptoms do overlap so much, that's a critical distinction because they're treated very differently. So it's a, it's a good tool that we have available by not only what the symptoms are, when they occur, but also looking at these blood tests. Was there another question? Can perimenopause occur in your 20s? Great question. It would be very rare for true menopausal changes to occur that early. Now this is a, a continuum. This is a, a bell curve. The average age is 51, but there are many women who can begin to see perimenopausal changes on the beginning of that curve. Mm -hmm. 20 would be very rare, except in the situation where someone has surgery and has their ovaries removed or in the instance where they're on certain medications that can interfere with the functioning of the ovaries. In that respect, they become functionally menopausal, even though the ovaries may come back later on. But the biggest distinction is oftentimes when they have a hysterectomy and have the ovaries removed also. Even if it, you were at age 20 and that occurred, at that point you become surgically menopausal, equivalent to someone whose ovaries had failed early but usually it's very rare and we don't see a whole lot in the way of changes much past 35 for true menopause. Many times if you're having symptoms associated with that, there are tests that can be done, but the first step is to rule out other medical conditions that can give the same symptoms. Thank you all very much.